of Harmony today. This is a big body Sovereign model from closer to the end of Harmony's Chicago production. These are gaining some appreciation to the point where people will invest some money in repairing them now rather than using them for target practice. And this particular specimen was purchased at a flea market, I'm told, and the seller was wearing an actual coonskin cap. So maybe that tells you something. The player got a good deal on it and he wants it done upright. This one was made in 1972. It's got a stamp on there in the corner. You can just sort of see it there in green ink that says S72. I've mentioned in the past that I've been told that the S would stand for second half of the year. Fs that are out there, they're the first half. And I've also been told by people who swear the S stands for spring, as in spring catalog, and the F is for fall catalog. I don't know which to believe. I don't know if it makes any difference at all, to be honest. This guy needs a bunch of things. It needs a neck reset. Just about any harmony you pick up in a flea market will. So maybe mentally add $500 to whatever the sticker price is, just so you've got a feel for what you're actually spending. The bridge is lifting along the, the uh, back edge here, which is not a surprise. The tuners in older harmonies, say from the 50s and 60s, those tend to be okay-ish, depending on how often it's hit the ground. The 70s ones, may, maybe not so much. And these have seen enough trauma that the customer is interested in replacing them with some nice open-backed Grovers here, which should definitely be a step up. Those might require some modifications. And let us take a look here at this wonderful piece of folk art. This had a headstock break at some point, and someone has decided to, you know, augment the glue with this mending plate. I have no idea what this is off of but it's got some interesting pierce work on it that seems like it might be Celtic. And it might be old. I don't know. Anyway, it's the coolest thing on the guitar, so we're going to leave that. The later Sovereigns also use this very period-specific script here that reminds me of something you'd see in the opening credits of a coming-of-age story from 1975. The headstock-facing veneer here, or plastic, has snapped during whichever injury broke the headstock, and it's being held in place by virtue of the truss rod cover alone, so we'll have to re-adhere that. And the frets, of course, are green. They require some cleanup. As for the nut, it doesn't fit very well, and you can see that the front edge has sheared off in places. So, 70s guitar, three years before the end of Harmony in America, not particularly valuable. Is it worth doing? It's not your decision, so you don't have to worry about it. This guitar has ladder bracing, and there are those who like to tear that out and install a Martin-style X-brace, and that's fine. I don't mind the sound of ladder bracing, and this player wants to maintain it, so that's what we're going to do. Let's get into it. Close to half the bridge is separated from the soundboard. I know for a fact that this was originally installed with hide glue, which is very forgiving. On another guitar, I might clean out the seam and inject some more hot glue in there, safe in the knowledge that it would reactivate the original stuff and all would be well with the world. However, there are two things that kind of push back against that idea this time. I don't know how long this has been open, but at some point the guitar was buffed with this white paste, which is stuck in the corners all the way around the bridge and in other places on the guitar. That stuff has usually a high wax component to it, and if the seam was open when someone dragged the car polisher over this, it might have sent gobs of it under there, making a really nice barrier to re-gluing. The other thing is, this has developed a bit of a warp as string tension tugged up on it. This pseudo-classical top-loading design is prone to that, as it has this really deep valley running through the middle of it. Sometimes you can set that right back down with clamps while gluing it on, but other times it's not so easy. If I take it off all the way, I can heat bend it back to flat before proceeding. Why the top loading bridge on a steel string guitar? Expediency, probably. Plus they save 12 cents on the bridge pins. You've seen me replace some Harmony bridges with the standard pin designs that go through the soundboard. Usually I augment the big softwood brace that goes right below here with a maple pad for wear resistance from the ball ends of the strings. That's a choice, you know. 
By coupling the ends of the string directly with the body, people assert that the sound is improved. Again, that's a judgment call. Someone might actually like the sound of this style better. These saddles are made of some kind of hard plastic, maybe some kind of nylon, and they tend to fracture pretty violently if you're trying to pull them out, so wear safety glasses if you do this. Sometimes I list the famous musicians known for playing a particular model in public, but there's not that many associated with the Sovereign. Um, two that come to mind, actually. There's um, John Sebastian played one at Woodstock when they dragged him up on stage there to fill time um, because of the delays ferrying bands to and from the site. So he was up there blazing away and tie-dyed everything. That guitar sounded really good in the recording. It wasn't even his, he just he borrowed it on his way to the stage. And the other one might be a bit of a surprise, but Jimmy Page. The intro to Stairway was played on a Sovereign. And apparently it was one of his main writing guitars for years. You can see how much warp this thing has got. This is going to take some time. I should be using the full-size household style iron, but I think my wife took that to work with her. Can't find it at the moment. Just going to try and get the whole thing evenly heated up all the way through the wood. Before it's had a chance to cool, I'll quickly clamp it to this flat chunk of phenolic. It's very rigid stuff. I wish I had bought more of it at the time. I'll expose the truss rod. Someone has modified the end of the head plate during its repair procedure, curving it up and around the uh, truss rod cover there. Interesting effect. It's a bit of a patchwork back here. You can see that the original holes have been plugged, so have some of the screw holes. The back of the headstock was painted with some brown paint, and there are pigtail scratches from uh, an orbital sander. Getting these bushings out can be a bit of a chore sometimes. You can see that this plastic headstock facing has shrunk up all the way around, so I imagine they're being held pretty tight. I'll try pushing them out from behind using an appropriately sized drill bit shank. That worked well. The original adhesive has turned into something of a gooey mess. It's hard in some areas and soft and rubbery in others. I think it was probably just standard contact cement. Some denatured alcohol did a pretty good job of getting rid of the sticky stuff. I applied a generous coat of fresh contact cement to both surfaces. After it had the requisite time to dry, I put in a couple of the tuner ferrules to act as positioning pins. And that will hold things in alignment. And I used a scrap block of wood, which I drilled two holes in the correct position so that I wasn't squishing the ferrules down into the face of the guitar. And uh, clamped that in several passes to make sure that both parts were well and truly secured. Repeated that process with the second half and then cleaned up the surface and any squeeze out with some naphtha. Well that won't do. Gotta re-drill all the holes. Actually, I'm drilling backwards, so I'm reaming them. Some of the previous screw holes are visible, so I'm going to have to plug those. This is a piece of 8th inch dowel, which I partially sharpen with a pencil sharpener. I'll clip them off and let them dry. In the interim, I'll go ahead and ream the front side for the bushings. I'll come back later with a little flush cutting saw and take off the excess. Then do some minor touch up with a marker. I mark the position of the screw holes with an awl and then drill the holes and screw them in place. Time to loosen the fingerboard extension. I transfer heat through the rosewood via the frets. Yes, I know Adam Savage talked about my little heating iron. The one he bought is much more fancy though. He got the super deluxe model and I'm kind of jealous. Wait till he sees how I'm going to use the hot slicing tool he's probably familiar with from his time in the foam shop because there's a new use for that thing that's being developed. Just ordered a couple of those. I'll pop the 15th fret. It's nice to mark one end so I can put it back in the same way it came out. 
and I'll drill holes for some electrodes. Positioning the holes can be a little bit hit and miss, as the dovetails aren't always the same length from guitar to guitar. The nice thing with dry heat as opposed to steam is it's not strictly necessary to hit the void. I was off by a couple of millimeters this time, but the heat still did its work. In go the resistance heaters. I let the neck warm up for about 10 minutes with some pressure from the jig screw on the heel cap, and check to make sure that it's loosening up. I can feel this one just wants to give way. They don't always want to come off so easily. It's nice when they do though. A lot of glue in there. That glue smells very like mildew. It seems to have been contaminated with spores of some kind. This neck has two very light shims on either side of the tenon at the bottom. And this glue, while it's still hot, kind of pull it right off. It's kind of crispy. Ah, I should take some samples of this mold because it could be useful. I'm assuming the white stuff is Penicillium camemberti, and the green Roque Forti. So I'll convert this to a cheesemaking channel and try not to run afoul of the stringent European regional food consortiums, because those guys play rough. But in truth, hide glue is a great medium for growing mold if it's kept in moist conditions. If you look at most of the really old Spanish guitars, they've got a whole sort of culture going on inside them. And true facts, I actually did work in a cheesemaking plant for a season when I was in school. So I'm just going to paint this with a bleach solution here, just to try to kill this stuff off before I inhale too much. Could be aspergillus, which is a much nastier kind of mold. It likes to grow in people's lungs and sinus cavities. I'll clean off the sides of the mortise and also the dovetail tenon. I'll get rid of the shims too. I need a little bit of wiggle room so that I can fit sandpaper between the parts when I'm resizing it. Then I'll take a little off the face of the neck too, just undercutting slightly. Unless you want a broken end block and split sides, it's important to remove the strap pin before resting the guitar on its tail while you do the sandpaper pulling. This is 120 grit, backed up with some packing tape. I like to brush off the dust particles between each pull. This process can take a while depending on how bad the neck angle is. It could be 60 or 80 strokes on each side. I tend to do them in lots of five and check frequently to sneak up on the desired angle which in this case means a straight edge on the top of the frets flies over the front edge of the bridge by about 1 32nd of an inch. I also check occasionally to make sure the center line of the neck matches up with the center line on the body by stretching a thread between the nut and the string holes in the bridge. When I'm ready to go, I've got a couple of little shims in the pocket there, and you can pick up the guitar without any glue in it, and the neck is firmly held in position. Sometimes I glue the shims to the cheeks of the tenon, sometimes I put them in the mortise. Today it was a mortise day. Get some glue on the parts and clamp it together. Here I'm planing a wedge for the fingerboard extension. The nut was too damaged for salvation, so I made a new nut blank, cut it to length, scribed the position of the strings, started the slots, and glued it into place. Then I did the same thing with the saddle. I left some extra height to work with. You can see I also routed the slot for a slightly wider saddle to improve the intonation possibilities. This was a through saddle, and though it has the same length, I made the slot slightly deeper to make adjustments easier and support it better. Okay, got this thing strung up for the first time. It's given us very nice action, just over 5 ths on the bass side, a little lower on the treble, with the expectation that it might come up by, say, half a 64th over the next few days as it settles in. It's also got a nice amount of saddle exposure, just about 7 64ths here in the center, just under an eighth of an inch, about three millimeters. 
you don't want a super tall saddle in a guitar with a through slot like this. More than about an eighth of an inch can get kind of risky because it acts like a lever and it just wants to crack the front right off the bridge. You'll see that a lot. Sounds good too. Even before shaping the top of the saddle and setting the intonation points. However, two issues. The first is there's a pretty big hump or belly behind the bridge here. Not uncommon in these older ladder brace guitars. The second thing is the high E string is a little bit lacking in terms of brake angle behind the saddle here. Now it sounds clear and fine, but I don't like the look of it. And you know, I wouldn't vouch for it over the long term. What's it going to do in 10 years? It'll probably be sort of flapping around on there. That's one thing about the top loader design. It doesn't have a lot of brake angle built into it, and subsequent deforming of the soundboard just eats into that. So it's one of the reasons why converting these to a pin bridge sometimes makes sense. I've seen several ways of dealing with this problem. The most creative was probably the introduction of a round-headed screw drilled into the front side of the channel here uh, with a groove filed into it, sort of like um, a string tree on a fender headstock. Or I suppose you could put in a model railroad spike like, like we do with a banjo capo. Um, for our purposes though, I think plugging the string hole and redrilling it might be more elegant. I don't need a whole lot more angle here, and these holes have gained a little bit of height um, over the years, just being worn in and out. This guitar might benefit from a bridge doctor device, you know, that could push out some of the hump behind the bridge, possibly increase the brake angle a little bit. It is sinking slightly in front. However, as I said, it's playing clean. The action's good. Um, the bridge doctor might be a call to make in six or seven years and see how this does. I expect the bridge has probably rotated about as much as it's going to in the last 50 years. This is one of those long chains of decision making where you have to ask, when do you stop? You know, how much money do we throw at this thing? It's gone from super high action to unplayable because the bridge was coming off to now having better action than it left the factory with. The sinking top thing around the sound hole, as we've seen in a number of harmonies now, is pretty much a given. Again, this is a ladder brace guitar, two big braces going across here, there's nothing on either side of the sound hole, so it just wants to fold up right in the middle here. I suppose I should get in there and put in a couple of straps. The other thing about these top loaders is you spend a lot of time completely de-stringing the guitar during the setup process. It's annoying. Here I'm gluing plugs into the first two string holes, carefully crafted tiny dowels which I'll saw flush and put some color on. While those dry, I'll make the sound hole support braces these are about four and a half millimeters high and maybe 13 millimeters wide, so they're reasonably stiff. I'll re-drill, doing my best to influence things downwards, and we ended up with about a 32nd of an inch extra clearance there, which is good. Here I'm measuring the position for the new braces. I filed the intonation points, and here I'm lightly sculpting the ends of the saddle. On these guitars, I don't usually take them down flush with the scoop. That leaves a little adjustment room in case it has to come down a bit more if things settle. All right, I think we're done. Chalk up another one. Was it worth it? Well, I gotta say, as a repair person, you if you take one of these jobs on, you gotta be prepared to do a lot of extra work that you did not count on at the beginning, because these are the proverbial can of worms. Hard to diagnose them without strings on, and then, you know, just one thing leads to another leads to another. But it's set up plays nicely. Sounds pretty good. So I think the customer will be happy.